So we bought our first Bitcoin in uh, in um, the fall of 2012, uh, end of the summer, and I think they were around eight, eight or nine dollars a coin. So high single digits. Um, and we've lived through at least three or four of these bull uh, cycles. So uh, this is pretty familiar territory for us. I, I imagine it is. And I have to say right now, as we are recording this, just check the live price, we're at about $32,000 a pop for Bitcoin. So does that price feel right to you? As investors who have been in this space since we were in the single digits, does 30,000 feel fair for where we are in the Bitcoin story today? So we wrote a thought piece in August of this year um, saying that we think the price of Bitcoin will be half a million or 500,000 per coin within the next decade. Um, so we think actually even at $30,000, it's still undervalued. And we think Bitcoin overtakes gold within this decade. Um, whether that happens in the next year or five or 10, you know, time will tell, but we actually think it's it's currently a, a bargain at $30,000. A bargain at $30,000 are not often words uttered on this podcast, so I'm glad to hear them here. Tyler, I'm curious to hear your perspective on the reasoning for this bid of, of $500,000 per coin for Bitcoin. Can you explain the reasoning for how you got there beyond just this is the next gold? Well, it really is about this is the next gold. If you look at the qualities that make gold gold, um, Bitcoin has those qualities or does better. So gold is scarce. The supply of Bitcoin is actually fixed. Gold's fairly portable, but you can send a Bitcoin around like an email. Um, Gold's sort of portable, uh, sorry, durable, but Bitcoin's actually very durable because it's digital and it's it's math. So um, it's, it's why we call Bitcoin gold 2.0. Um, we think it will disrupt gold. And the market cap of gold is $9 trillion right now. Um, I don't know what Bitcoin it, Bitcoin's is, but for Bitcoins to be $9 trillion, each Bitcoin would have to be worth 500,000 a Bitcoin. So that's kind of how we back into that. We look at the market cap of gold and then divide it by uh, what the price of Bitcoin would have to be to be worth $9 trillion and we come out at 500,000. And, and why that's really important right now is it's because the, the money printing that's been going on um, really over the past decade, but that has really gone into overdrive with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think something like the supply has increased um, I think 23.5% in the past year alone, which is astounding. And the classic um, inflation hedge historically has been gold. If this was the 1970s, you would buy gold. If this was even a decade ago, you would buy gold. But now we have this digital, digital version of gold that's actually better. And a lot of um, big investors are, are putting on the Bitcoin trade and they're saying, well, gee, uh, between these two, I see, you know, one's this multi thousand year established store of value. And this other asset is this emergent store of value that offers an incredible upside in addition to protecting against inflation. And and I think um, we're also seeing some um, companies actually buy it in their treasury, MicroStrategy being the biggest one. I think they've taken a half a billion dollar position and it's likely to be the trade of the decade. Um, and it's all about basically protecting against the money printing that has been going on. Absolutely. And we're going to talk in depth about this money printing, the Fed's role in this entire Bitcoin conversation. But I'm curious to hear your perspective here on on why gold isn't going to be the next gold, right? An established store of value that's been around for thousands of years, it has been a valuable asset for thousands of years, should have staying power. What is going to diminish gold from being a store of value for people moving forward? Is it just not going to be as good a hedge against inflation as Bitcoin or other cryptos? Well, I think the the one of the challenges with gold is its hardware. It's actually really hard to move. And in in a pandemic or some kind of disaster force majeure scenario, gold's actually not really practical. Bitcoin's incredibly easy to move. It's information. You can just send it through the internet like your email. So that's that's the first issue. Um, the second piece is we're all living online and Bitcoin is programmable money. So it's really built for the future of the online world. So those are two things right there that sort of make Bitcoin more attractive. Obviously, gold has familiarity and it's in movies and it's shiny and we use it for jewelry and, and people 
have have grown up with it. But if you talk to Gen Z or millennials, they don't they don't want gold. They 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 want software. Yeah, Tyler, anything to add? Well, um, one point that I think is important that a lot of people don't understand is you don't have to purchase just one Bitcoin. You can purchase a fraction of Bitcoin or as little as five dollars of a Bitcoin. Um, there's a big misconception that you have to spend all thirty thousand dollars on you know one share of Bitcoin. Um, so we think that if if Bitcoin goes up to five hundred thousand of Bitcoin, it's a sixteen about a sixteen x return from here. So you could put five dollars into Bitcoin and potentially get a sixteen times return. Right, which would be maybe not as meaningful amount of money as as the kinds of investments that people like yourselves are making, but is not nothing nonetheless. Right. I want to hear your thoughts on how COVID-19 specifically has contributed to the rally that we've seen in Bitcoin over the last couple of weeks. We were up to, I know, I, I started covering Bitcoin in 2017 when the big price was $20,000. Everybody thought that that was a huge deal. And now we've seen that high watermark essentially doubled. It's pulled back some since that 40,000 uh, benchmark here. but how much of this rally can we contribute to the COVID-19 pandemic and the stimulus that the government has has enacted in order to respond appropriately to that pandemic? So we think that, that Bitcoin is inevitable, um, but COVID has definitely accelerated a lot of things. It's sort of accelerated the death of retail. Um, retail was going to, you know, it's, it was in the final throes, so to speak, and we're seeing all of a sudden now everything's sort of moving online a lot quicker. And you see that with, with Netflix and the, the FANG companies. A ton of value has accrued rapidly to these companies because of COVID. It sort of pushed us three, four or five years down the road. So we think that Bitcoin was always going to happen. It's just that COVID has accelerated the money printing, which has really accelerated the, the narrative and set the stage for, for Bitcoin, if you will. The other challenge I would add with gold is that gold's actually a very plentiful element in the universe. Um, if you look at asteroids floating around Earth, there's there's billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars. Gold is just precious on our planet. And I think it's very realistic that within the next 25 years, someone like Elon Musk puts a probe onto an asteroid and potentially starts mining it. Uh, for for gold and silver and all kinds of um, uh, you know metals and there's already NASA missions um, in this direction for that so so that's another sort of near uh, sort of towards mid midterm issue with gold which we can go and do more but uh, that is a, that is one of the challenges also facing it you cannot increase the supply of Bitcoin it is truly fixed you can't mine more. Um, you can't expand it, but gold actually expands with demand and as energy costs, which is the key mining input, decreases. So two thirds of above ground gold stock has been mined in the last 50 years alone. 